And we're going to start by reviewing the fact that Christianity, those people who claim to be Christian and who live a Christian life, have one core foundational belief. It is that God, the God with a capital G, exists. That he is. He's also the great I am. Many other names fall upon our lips to describe God. His existence always has been and always will be. Ouch. Brain cells just collided trying to wrestle with that. Always has been and always will be. God also supports the existence of mankind, the existence of the universe. Everything around us and everything going away, as we now know, the universe is expanding and growing constantly. God had a hand in that, and we see that borne out very basically through the statistical likelihood that the perfect accident occurred to create the universe, the earth, and mankind. Statistically, it doesn't happen, but yet it is. God created, and what he created had the needed diversity for the universe, for the earth, for mankind. Diversity in the makeup of the universe, suns, moons, planets, asteroids, the makeup of the earth, dirt and water and clay, green things to eat, animals to eat. God, in knowing where the creation would go and knowing where he wanted people to arrive in the creation, God structured everything for those people. God structured everything to support his plan. The Bible tells us in multiple places that before the universe ever existed, there was a salvation, there was a way, there was a man who was the solution for the penalty of sin, which is death. God also had a hand in morality. We look at Jesus and we see how God looks at us and the morality that is needed. We look at two examples briefly. Jesus walks up to the well in the New Testament, the well that he shouldn't be at, the well that everyone else knows he shouldn't be at, because Jesus and the people that live around the well come from two opposite cultures, two diversely different ideas and thoughts and principles of living. Jesus waits, and the woman comes to him to get water, and he teaches her. Well, if you want to really live, you need the water that I can give you, that will be greater than the water in the well. And Jesus leads her to the point where she understands who he is. He's a prophet, and she knows it. She walks away from the well aware of what her experience was and aware of the greatness of who she met. In another circumstance, Jesus is teaching out near the edge of a city. And the local authorities wait and capture a woman in a sexual act with somebody she shouldn't be with, and they bring her to Jesus. And Jesus looks at her, looks at him, the others there. Uh, when I say him, I mean those people who brought the woman. And in looking at them, Jesus basically starts moments that will connect to lead to the point where those accusers who say she's wrong here's the penalty she should be killed Jesus knows that's coming they know that's coming 
and nothing occurs when those accusations are made. In fact, Jesus isolates her from her accusers to the point that they don't aim at her anymore with their words and with their threats and with their accusations. One of the things that comes out of that moment is that the woman is spiritually behind Jesus and he's in front of her and all of her accusers. And now we see a metaphor born. And the metaphor is Jesus is between us and our death. And this woman walks away from this experience, having met Jesus. She wasn't told she was forgiven in the words, you are forgiven. But she understood what had happened. She understood the greatness of her experience. She understood that something unique and special and precious had occurred. And Jesus says, hey, you know what I said is true. You know what you just experienced is true and just. Now go walk in the way that I've just shown you. And she basically walks away from that moment knowing she's escaped her penalty, she's escaped death, she's escaped the accusers, and for the first time in her life, we see what very likely was the first time she'd ever been treated the way God intended her to be treated. And she was treated that way by Jesus. God's greatness, his enormous scope of vision for the universe, the expansion of it, people, lives, births, all the things that come into that, the greatness of the creation we live in. There are physical, tangible rules in place like gravity, like the mathematics of light. All these things are there in their finely balanced formulas that make the universe and the environment stable and make it very, very fundamentally consistent for men, for women, for children to live in. Goodness. God's goodness. How could a God create an earth, create life, create a place that that life lives, and then allow sin to come to be, death, murder, robbery, thievery, immorality, all kinds of things. How could a God let that happen? Let all those things occur in that world and in the societies of the world. My response to you is that's not the rest of the sentence. The rest of the sentence would say, but I, God, also have given you a solution, an answer, a restorer, a redeemer, a reconciler, who will save you from the guaranteed penalty of that sin. The penalty is death, and that Savior, in the same way that I created earth and everything on it, I also give you my son, a part of myself. God gives that to us. Now, God also has some other qualities. He's omnipotent, which means he can do whatever he wants. He's immortal, which means he's constant in character, always there, eternal. God is omnipresent. That simply means I made the universe, I'm everywhere in it. There goes those brain cells crashing into each other again, and I'm trying to think, wow, everywhere. Recently, in the last six months, scientists in Europe in the Hedron Collider, where they are discovering new particles, found a particle that comes out of nowhere and goes to nowhere, and they have seen it in more than one place at once. 
it's documented mathematically. Hundreds of pages of math to explain the theory, but yet this particle can be called into presence and then it goes off transiently. But it's in more than one place at once. God is also omniscient. He knows all. Well, my response to that would be, I'm pretty sure he does since he made all. And he is consistent. When we think of the things that we know and that we learn and that we function by in our lives, little kids with parents, grandparents, growing up, going to school, all those things as we come up into uh, adulthood, what we learn, what we learn to be able to function at work, to function with family, to function socially, all those things are there because God wanted them and he put them in place. Now another thing about God. If you want to know what God is like, you have but only to look at Jesus. Because Jesus is exactly like God. We don't say Jesus is here and God's just like him theologically or doctrinally because that's not accurate. But it is accurate in a visual suggestion of what God is like. Why would God send a part of himself to man to deal with sin and not have it be, not have that person be like him? Think for just a minute. The Ten Commandments, if they were all obeyed, upheld, observed, functioned, and were fulfilled in everyone's life, we'd have a world exactly like the world Jesus told people about, where Jesus said, love God with all your mind and heart and body and soul, and uh, love God, love other people. Very simply, the result could be the same between having the Ten Commandments fulfilled and doing what Jesus said, to love God and love fellow man. So Jesus is the personification of God in character, in morals, in kindness and love and cherishing life. We see times where Jesus had great emotional responses. There's the one verse that says simply, Jesus wept. There's an emotional response to Lazarus in his experience at his death that Jesus has. And Jesus has an emotional response when he's on the cross. A lot of people don't know it, but the cross and his crucifixion isn't just putting a man on a piece of wood and watching him die. He actually took a lot of time and sang traditional prayers of his countrymen, his people, the people of his lineage, and he sang those prayers which were customary, they were rituals to be upheld, and in singing those prayers the way he did, when he did, it was a not loudly yelled, but kind of a whispered plea for the people to still be loved and be cared for by their God. So God gives us a lot. He gives us a lot in the form of our living environment and in the form of our future through Jesus Christ. Now, one of the uh, big things that comes into being for me personally is wrestling with sin. Man, I've been trying to not do that for a whole year and a half, and I find myself doing it. Well, Paul addressed that when he said, I find it, it's a law. That I will not to do, that I do, and that I will not to do is exactly what I do do. But in that, we're not lost, we're not thrown away, we're not cast down. 
we're still a part of the family of God. His children, the church is his bride. Jesus is our brother. He's also the husband. All these metaphors point at family relational living. Now I'm here to tell you a couple of things. Just because you might have mistakes, you might slip up, you might screw up really bad. Because God put a solution in place and had the wisdom and understanding to put Jesus Christ in place and put the Holy Spirit in place, we're not lost because we fail. God's not a works-based, performance-based, success-based, obedience-based God. We only have to look at the life of King David to see how that played out. Here's David making all these mistakes. Some of them went way beyond mistakes and way beyond screwing up. Some of them were just absolutely royal, pathetic human acts. And yet, his heart never turned away from his God. His words seldom departed from accepting God and understanding who he is and why he is. David set a milestone and a and an example for us. Now, when we compare ourselves to the universe, we have to ask, where do we fit into everything? Well, the everything that we call our life, that we call our existence, is based upon interaction. We live in a world that we have to talk to people. If we don't, it can create problems or deprive us of things. We live in a world where we're expected in many cases to share what we have mastered, what we have come to understand, and what we know. There's interactions that occur, but interactions are not the same as relationships. Now, interactions can have a specific goal specific actions that are committed, maybe step one, two, three, four, and five, and you get a result. But relationship, relationship is based upon persistent connection, persistent communication. By connection, I mean relational in the sense of praying and hearing prayer, speaking to God, hearing an answer. That kind of relationship is where God wants us to look and focus. Through a life experience, even the death of a mate, the death of a child, we're brought to a stronger, fuller understanding of life. And we're brought to a fuller and stronger understanding of God and who he is and what he is for and what we are for. Through pain and adversity, it is possible for healing and comfort to come. God, remember, after creating the universe and everything that is in it, gave us a solution, a guarantee of not having to die the death that our sins require. In that, we have to remember that as people, we either take the truth of God and stand on it, or we don't. It's a lot like standing on a fence post. You can stand on a fence post with one leg, but that other leg is kind of hanging out there over nothing. When we live our lives, and when we live our lives the way God calls us to, it is about our primary purpose being to worship and love God. And in worshiping and loving God, a secondary outcome is loving others, family, friends, neighbors. It's setting an example and showing 
just like God was foretold in the Old Testament, and he was introduced to peoples, to nations, through word, through stories, sometimes through experiences like plagues or losing an entire army in the ocean. Through this, we are there for God to worship and praise him and the fact that he has given us charge of what we have. And God is there to support us and nurture us and love us and to care for us and to provide solutions. Now, solutions can be for little teeny things. I got a flat tire. God, just have somebody pull over to the shoulder where my car's broke down so that I can get help. All the way up to death. To tremendous loss. And God will support us through that. He has promised it in his word. But he also has delivered that once through Jesus on the cross. Other times through those around us. Curtis has delivered me personally and spiritually with words that were perfectly timed and set exactly as they needed to be. God delivered me today through Diane. A long time ago, Diane said, send me, I'll go. I'll do that. All of us have those opportunities to do things and to be experienced. But our God is a God who wants us connected with other people. A good, godly, let's even say perfect Christian shouldn't live in a Christian society, in a Christian city, in a Christian neighborhood, on a Christian cul-de-sac, with all Christian neighbors, and never come in contact with the earth. That's the opposite of what he put Jesus on the mission of. We have to remember that. Our God gives us what we have, what we can do, who we are personally, to share with other people and to shed light on who God is, who Jesus is, and who the Holy Spirit is. You see, there are some religions that actually believe you can go out into a desert and get on your knees and take off all your robes and be totally naked and that you can come to a revelation of whole and complete understanding of the universe. But that's the opposite of what God says. Why have a human race if the only one that's going to matter is a single human? That contradicts the reason for creation. It contradicts the rest of the things around us in life. There are a couple of things that are profoundly important for people. One is to learn to trust and love and be loved towards God, towards men, towards friends, towards family. And another one is being able to tell of the greatness of God. Christians have a tremendously powerful asset that they use. Some use it often. Some rarely use it, possibly because they don't know what it is. I'll ask a question. What is the greatest asset that a person has for sharing the gospel and introducing people to God? Those who know the answer, Sit on it for a minute. Nancy, do you know the answer or do you want to share? Okay. Personal testimony. People tend to think the gospel in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the examples and the things that Jesus said, those are the most valuable things, but it's not. What is valuable is your story because when you go tell your story of what Jesus did in intervening and stopping a problem and making this happen and all these things occur, your telling that story makes it personal and creates a relationship question that can answer 
to the question, well, how'd that happen? Well, why did it happen to you? When we're born and we're put on the earth, the vision that God has is that that baby is desired and sought after and that it is desired and sought after by its parents and its grandparents and those others given charge of it to raise it into a whole and complete person and to teach it nurture it heaven forbid something would happen that would cost that child its life but we're put here to become connected to people emotionally and physically the emotional part is sharing each other's burdens. It is praying with and for each other. Sometimes it's sitting and watching a ball game with each other. Sometimes it's sitting at a table and eating. And sometimes it's coming to the hospital when the worst phone call comes and you go to support a brother or a sister or both. But it's about relationship. Now again, I want to restate positively here. I want to make sure this is understood. God didn't create the universe, create the earth, and create us just because. He created us for each other and for him. And he created the presence of the Holy Ghost and of Jesus for us to do what he envisioned us doing, to love him, and we receive that love back. And when it runs its track, the love that God envisions and intends for mankind comes through friends, comes through neighbors, it comes through family, it comes through people you don't know and you just meet, it comes from people who move in across the street. It comes from people that you've never seen before, you see once and they're gone. They go on with the rest of their life. But of everything I've said, take this to heart. There is not a single sin that God has not dealt with, does not deal with, that falls on the shoulder of Jesus Christ that his death didn't pay for. Every sin that ever was or will be created by mankind can be covered by the death of Jesus. The Bible says it. The manuscripts that are not in the published Bible, the uncanonized writings of people, say it. And the reality is that when you look at people's lives and you look at the internal makeup of who they are as people, you tend to find God's blessing. People that are really on track with God, people that are living and are experiencing and able to share the way God envisioned, they're people who move from luck and time and chance and just the frivolity of of things happening without a purpose, they move away from that and they move to the fact that there are signs and wonders from God. It can be as simple as going through a line at a local drive through and you get to the window and you realize, oh wow, that's a huge ice cream cone. I hope I can eat it all. And the girl comes and says, oh, don't worry, your bill's been paid. The car in front of you paid for you. Now, what do you do with that? Hopefully, you would think of paying it forward. Because we don't know what God's doing in the car in front or the car behind us, but we do know God is there, he is present, he is around. People only have to ask, and he avails himself in their lives. He avails themselves in ways tends to happen on the deathbed in the last hours of living. People recall the structure and they recall the experiences and they suddenly realize 
Wow. That wasn't time and chance or luck. That was a sign from God that he was there. Now, I'm not telling you that that's the only way to believe. I'm also not telling you that that is the only truth, what we've talked about. But what I'm telling you is that if you honor loving God, worshiping God, loving Jesus by doing what he asks, by joining him in his mission with mankind, and by hearing the Holy Spirit and submitting yourself to it, if you do that, you're on track. You see, it comes down to a point where the abnormal can demonstrate the greatness that God has. I met a young man years ago with Down syndrome who after two years of attending church with his mom and dad up in Seattle went to the pastor and asked to be baptized. And when the pastor said, okay, I'd be happy to do that, but what brought you here to ask? This young man said simply, Jesus cared enough to die for me. Well, I want to get in the water and die for him. Now, think of that metaphor. This young man, very severely limited mentally, who stood there in front of a pastor, had an answer that made sense more than many of us. When we look at those around us, the Holy Spirit puts signs in front of us and shows us these little wonders. Don't ignore them. Don't ignore them. If you need to have a question answered, come ask. If you need to unload, come ask. If you need to be loaded up and filled, come ask. If you don't understand, come ask. That's what we're here for. We, the church, are here to proclaim God proclaim Jesus and proclaim the Holy Spirit and the greatness that God had when he put that solution in place. That solution is Jesus who gave the comforter and the tool to guide us we call the Holy Spirit. How do we respond to that? We respond to that by taking our personal story and sharing it with people we respond to that by telling them about the great things that God has done. And then we go introduce them to the person that it happened to. We respond by pointing people back to promises. You know, we go from the Old Testament, Old Covenant, the Law of Moses, to the New Covenant in the New Testament, We'll call it the law of love. They both seek the same completion point. They both seek love. They both seek obedience. One has the consequence removed if you walk in the Spirit and join Jesus in his mission and let him come live in you. That's how simple it is. We do not believe here that there is a sin great enough to rob you of eternal life. All sin was paid for by Jesus' death. How could you not want to test that? How could you not want to see if it's true? How could you not want a part of that? How could you not want to seek out and see if it's real and partake of it. I've gotten to do a few funerals for friends of ours and one for a person I didn't know at all. But there were issues, substance abuse, addiction, other problems. And what amazes me 
is the people that I did the service for who got buried and went to their eternal resting place, those people had an emotional bond with God and with Jesus and the Holy Spirit that was incredible. And they failed daily. But they also did not ever fail to talk about Jesus, talk about the Holy Spirit, talk about the plan that God made. So no, going forward, we believe you are saved. Every one of you, and you have only to do two things. Accept the salvation and participate in a relationship that comes through church and through other people and through friendship and through love and help. You know, when we're done with the service in a few minutes, we're going to go eat. And that table is the same thing Jesus sat around with the people he interacted with and worked with, the ones he taught, the ones he ministered to. If you have need of something, come ask. We want to know. We want to support and help and guide and do everything we can. God is a loving God who wants the best for us. All the evidence points to a God who provided everything to make our life rich, whole, and holy. We have only to partake of it to receive it. Let's bow our heads. Thank you, Dad, for giving us today. Thank you for giving us the rain that has brought the green back to the trees and the grass around us. We thank you for our house that we get to come and worship in here, for giving us everything we have here at New Hope, for hands and feet and minds that share, that participate, that want to give, for people who come from you because you wanted mankind to exist and you made it so. We thank you for Jesus and the heart that he has. And we know that it is through him all things come to be and that through him we are able to come to you and only through him. So thank you for that. Please bless the food that we're about to partake of. Please bless our time, our travel, our safety. And please bless our minds and hearts to know that we can go to each other and we can share things and that through wisdom and doing things appropriately, we can have a guidance and friendship and caring to support us through the darkest days and the brightest days of our lives as well. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.